In this video on Robert's Rules of Order, I'll introduce the foundational framework for conducting effective and democratic meetings. Do you find yourself drowning in disorganized meetings, unsure how to navigate the maze of decision-making? Then you are in the right place. Today will transform the way you look at meetings and decision-making. Let's first look at the concept of deliberative assemblies and understand why they are governed by specific rules. What is a deliberative assembly? A deliberative assembly is a gathering of people who come together to discuss, debate, and make decisions as a group. For example, you are leading a team to decide on next year's school budget. There are many suggestions. More funding to STEM, upgrading sports facilities, hiring more staff. It's a cacophony of well-intended suggestions, each echoing the passionate interests of different team members. Now, if you have a structured process that turns multiple suggestions into an actionable decision, you are entering the world of deliberative assemblies. It's not just any meeting, it's where every voice comes together to make collective democratic decisions. There are five types of deliberative assemblies, mass meeting, local assembly of an organized society, convention, legislative body, and the board. Mass meetings are often public gatherings and agenda focused. They're often instrumental for administrators and leaders who engage with larger communities. A town hall meeting where parents, teachers, and school administrators discuss a new school policy or address a recent incident affecting student safety. The meeting is open to all stakeholders and it's a one-off event focusing on that specific topic. Mass meetings can also be public forums on education reform. Think of a large gathering organized by a legislative body where educators, administrators, and even students can voice their opinions on proposed changes to state or national educational policies. Another example of mass meeting is a faculty and staff open forum. Sometimes schools or colleges may hold open forums where all employees can discuss broad issues like strategic direction, institutional values, or proposed changes in employment terms. The second type of deliberative assemblies is local assemblies of an organized society. They are often the more routine yet important type of meetings where more defined groups come together to make ongoing discussions. Teachers and other educational staff may belong to unions that have their own formal meetings where topics like collective bargaining agreements and member benefits are discussed. The third type of deliberative assemblies is convention. Conventions are larger often more formal gatherings that bring together a wide variety of stakeholders, usually from multiple organizations or jurisdictions, to make decisions or exchange ideas. One historical example that stands out is the Constitutional Convention held in 1787 during the aftermath of the Revolutionary War. This convention brought together representatives from different states to frame the U.S. Constitution, a monumental decision that has shaped governance in the United States for centuries. In contemporary settings, conventions can serve many purposes and sectors. For example, representatives from local teachers' unions across a state or even the nation may convene to address important issues such as collective bargaining, educational policies, and professional development. Similarly, a research organization may hold a convention to discuss collaborative research projects, the standardization of curricula, or to engage in a discourse on the most recent issues in a particular field of research. The power of a convention lies in its ability to convene a diverse range of perspectives for concentrated discussion and often decisive action. Just as the Constitutional Convention served an important role in the founding of a nation, 
modern conventions continue to shape policies, practices, and the collective understandings in different fields. The fourth type of deliberative assemblies is legislative body. Think of this as your school board or university's governing body. These are high-stakes meetings where long-term strategies are crafted and policies that affected the entire educational ecosystem are ratified. The fifth type of deliberative assembly is boards, such as boards of directors and advisory boards. In many public school districts in the United States, board members are elected by local voters. However, in some cases, they may be appointed by other elected officials, such as a mayor or a governor. For example, the Boston School Committee governs Boston public schools. The committee is not elected, but rather appointed by the mayor of Boston. Its members serve a four-year term and are tasked with duties such as policy setting, budget approval, superintendent selection. This governance model aims to create alignment between city government and the public education system. It could affect how closely the Boston School Committee aligns with the mayor's agenda as opposed to an elected school board that may be more directly responsive to voters' concerns. In higher education, the method of appointment for the Board of Trustees of public universities varies by state. In many states, the governor appoints members to the Board of Trustees, often with the advice and the consent of the state senate. In the state of New York, the governor appoints members of the Board of Trustees for the State University of New York. Those appointments are typically subject to confirmation by the New York State Senate. However, in some states, members are elected, and in others, appointments are made by different bodies or officials. In the state of Michigan, board members for major public universities, like the University of Michigan, and Michigan State University are elected statewide. Understanding the characteristics of a deliberative assembly is like knowing the ground rules before stepping onto the playing field. The four characteristics are membership criteria, quorum requirements, meeting frequency, and decision-making authority. The characteristics shape the framework in which decisions are made ensuring that the process is democratic, transparent, and efficient. Let's look at each characteristic with example. First, membership criteria are usually defined by specific rules or bylaws, such as being an employee of a school district. The participants in a deliberative assembly are not just a random gathering of people. They're specifically chosen based on set criteria that are outlined in the organization's rules or bylaws. In the context of a school board, membership may consist of elected officials from the community, appointed educational administrators, and sometimes even include student or parent representative to ensure a full spectrum of perspectives. In a university, a board of regents or a faculty senate could be the deliberative assembly of interest. Here, the membership may not only include tenured professors and department chairs, but also other stakeholders like administrative staff, alumni representatives, and even student body presidents. Some universities also include non-academic staff and external advisors, such as industry experts or philanthropists to bring diverse viewpoints into strategic discussions. Having clearly defined membership criteria is like building a solid foundation for a house. It ensures that all stakeholders have a seat at the table, whether they are parents concerned about school policies or professors interested in academic freedom. This membership diversity helps to create a balanced and democratic decision-making process. It also sets the guidelines for who has the power to make motions, debate, and vote, 
ensuring that the assembly's actions are both legitimate and representative of the community it serves. The second characteristic of a deliberative assembly is quorum requirements. The term quorum comes from Latin, where it means of whom. Initially, it was used in England to indicate the minimum number of justices of the peace needed for a legal proceeding in a county. Over time, this concept was adopted by legislative bodies like the House of Commons in the United Kingdom. By 1640, a rule was established that the Speaker of the House could not start a meeting unless at least 40 members were present. The concept of quorum also made its way to America. A 1691 law in Massachusetts stated that at least 40 representatives needed to be present for the legislative house to conduct official business and pass bills. Today, a quorum is the minimum number of members that must be present for the assembly to conduct its business officially and legally. Decisions made without a quorum are often considered null and void. The quorum requirement ensures that enough diverse voices are part of the conversation to reach a decision that is representative and legitimate. The specific number or percentage required is usually stated in the organization's bylaws or rules. A quorum is not just a procedural formality. It's the beating heart of democratic legitimacy in the deliberative assembly. A simple majority, often defined at 50% plus one of all voting members, is a frequently used quorum requirement in many deliberative assemblies. This threshold is commonly considered practical and effective for ensuring that decisions are made with adequate representation and legitimacy. A simple majority strikes a balance between requiring enough members for representative decision-making and not setting the bar so high that it becomes impractical to meet. Meetings can proceed without undue delays, as achieving a simple majority is often easier than achieving a higher percentage, like two-thirds or three-quarters, also known as supermajority. A simple majority is the go-to standard. It's the fast track for a group to make decisions. However, fast does not always mean well-considered. In the rush to reach a decision, the perspectives of fewer people may be overlooked. It's like only hearing from the front row in the lecture hall while ignoring voices from other corners. You may be moving quickly. Not everyone is on board, creating potential discord down the road. A supermajority is a requirement for a level of support that is greater than a simple majority. Typically used for more serious or consequential matters, a supermajority may require, for example, two-thirds or three-quarters of votes to pass a decision. This approach aims to ensure broader agreement and deliberation. Opting for a supermajority has its advantages. First, it's a consensus-driven approach. Decisions made through the supermajority quorum requirement are more likely to enjoy widespread support, much like an academic program that undergoes rigorous review and ends up with unanimous faculty approval. It's not just about getting to a decision, it's about getting to a decision that most people stand behind. Second, requiring more voices for a decision leads to more stable outcomes. And this mechanism acts as a barrier against hasty or divisive actions, giving you added assurance that you are on the right track. Think of it as a building risk management tool for your decision-making process. A supermajority also serves as a protective measure for diverse views. The requirement for a larger majority ensures that minority viewpoints get a seat at the table, acting as a safeguard for a more comprehensive set of interests within the assembly. However, a supermajority requirement comes with its own set of challenges. 
Reaching a supermajority is sometimes lengthy and at times cumbersome. Another risk is decision-making paralysis, commonly known as deadlock. When a supermajority is hard to achieve, especially for contentious issues, there is a real risk that no decision will be made, leaving the assembly in a state of limbo. Moreover, a small subset of members can wield disproportionate influence by stalling or even preventing decisions from being made. This creates an imbalance of power where a minority can essentially veto actions which may not always be in the best interest of the larger group. The third characteristic of a deliberative assembly is meeting frequency. It's governed by both organizational needs and formal governance documents. This can range from weekly meetings for teams to annual assemblies for the board of an organization. The schedule sets the pace for decision-making, agenda setting, and overall organizational productivity. The frequency of meetings is often a direct reflection of the assembly's responsibilities. For example, an emergency response team at a hospital may require weekly or even daily meetings to effectively coordinate efforts and make time-sensitive decisions. On the other hand, a university's board of trustees may only convene quarterly or semi-annually because their decisions are more strategic and long-term in nature, involving substantial data collection and analysis before each gathering. Meeting frequency is not set in stone. It can be adapted to suit evolving needs. In response to significant events like a public health crisis or major organizational change, special meetings may be called outside the regular schedule. For example, a committee at a university typically meets once a month, but may hold additional sessions during accreditation reviews or significant curriculum changes. While frequent meetings allow for agile decision-making, they also risk meeting fatigue among members, potentially diminishing engagement and productivity. On the other hand, infrequent meetings may lead to a backlog of agenda items and rush decisions. So when setting the meeting frequency for a deliberative assembly, it's essential to strike a balance. The goal is to meet often enough to make timely decisions but not so frequently that the quality of those decisions or the well-being of the members suffers. The fourth characteristic of a deliberative assembly is decision-making authority. In organizational decision-making, think of a deliberative assembly as the conductor of a symphony. Much like the conductor makes efforts of different instruments to create a cohesive musical experience, the deliberative assembly integrates the inputs of its diverse members to arrive at well-considered decisions. The authority vested in the deliberative assembly functions like the conductor's baton guiding the process, tempo, and ultimately the outcomes. Decision-making authority is typically outlined in organizational bylaws akin to a playbook or an owner's manual. This sets the scope and the limitations of the assembly's power. For example, a university's bylaws may explicitly state that only the board of trustees has the authority to change tuition rates, approve new academic programs, or allocate large sums of money for infrastructure projects. By contrast, a student council may be empowered to allocate funds for student activities but would not have the authority to change tuition. In public school systems, the school board holds the ultimate authority for key decisions such as hiring and firing of staff, including teachers and often the superintendent themselves. While the superintendent may be heavily involved in the recruitment and interview process, recommending candidates to the board. It's usually the board that must approve those decisions. This setup allows for checks and balances, 
ensures that one person does not hold undue influence over significant decisions. The hierarchical approach to decision-making safeguards the system against potential abuses of power and ensures a more democratic process. In other words, the school board, which is often elected and thus representative of the community, has the final word on matters of great importance in a school district. The level of decision-making authority defines not just what decisions are made, but also how they resonate through the organization. For example, in the bylaws of a university, it is explicitly stated that the department of faculty hold the decision-making authority for determining admission requirements. This could be anything from setting the minimum GPA for program entry to requiring specific prerequisite courses or even interviews. When a single administrator unilaterally decides on student admission requirements, it could create several potential issues, especially if those decisions are traditionally within the purview of a faculty or another deliberative assembly as per the bylaws. For administrators and leaders, bypassing the said decision-making process undermines the governance structure. This could lead to mistrust among faculty who may feel that their expertise and role in governance are being disregarded. Faculty may feel disincentivized to participate in future governance activities knowing their input could be so easily sidelined. Moreover, decisions made outside the established channels may lack legitimacy and could be subject to challenges or reversals, causing administrative confusion and delays. If the bylaws explicitly state that a certain body, like the faculty, has the authority to set admission requirements and administrators' unilateral action could potentially expose the institution to legal challenges. In essence, while a single administrator may expedite the decision-making process, the long-term consequences of bypassing established procedures can be significant and far-reaching. In many organizations, the assembly's authority is not unilateral, but is balanced with other governing bodies. For example, a university senate proposal may require final approval from the Board of Trustees. The bottom line is that understanding the extent and the limitations of decision-making authority is important for effective governance. It enables leaders and administrators to navigate complex issues with clarity, precision, and accountability. The functions of deliberative assembly are critical components that facilitate collective decision-making. The functions of agenda setting, debate, voting, amending, and the point of order and appeals serve as the gears of the assembly machine, each contributing to its overall effectiveness. Agenda setting lays out the items that deliberative assembly will discuss and decide about. This stage sets the tone and the direction of the meeting ensuring that all relevant issues are brought to the table. A well-crafted agenda minimizes distractions and inefficiencies, enabling the assembly to focus on strategic priorities. It also gives members time to prepare for discussions, allowing for more informed and effective debate. Debate is the cornerstone of democratic governance. It's the platform where ideas are scrutinized, questions are raised, and assumptions are tested. A healthy debate enriches decision-making process by exposing members to a diversity of perspectives. This can lead to creative solutions and prevent groupthink, which happens when group members refrain from expressing doubts, criticisms, or deviations from the apparent group consensus. They may ignore alternatives and typically favor unanimity at the expense of quality decisions. 
Voting refers to formalizing the assembly's collective decision on a particular issue. Voting methods can vary from a simple show of hands to a secret ballot or even electronic voting. Voting ensures that every member has a say in the outcome, translating individual opinions into collective action. The voting process legitimizes the decision of the assembly, providing the mandate for implementation. Amending is the iterative process of refining proposals to meet the assembly's objectives better. Amendments can modify, add to, or even delete portions of a proposal. For example, during a city council meeting, an amendment may be proposed to allocate additional funds for public transport within a larger budget bill. Amendments optimize proposals, ensuring they're both practical and aligned with the assembly's goals. They make room for improvement and adaptation, which is particularly important in complex or contentious issues. Point of order and appeals are procedural mechanisms to ensure the assembly adheres to its rules and guidelines. They help maintain the integrity and the fairness of the deliberative process. In a legislative body, if a member feels that a rule has been broken, they can raise a point of order, prompting the chair to make a ruling. For example, you're part of a legislative body in an educational institution, tasked with reviewing a new proposed curriculum for a re-ramped computer science program. The agenda is packed and everyone is eager to move things along. Joe, a faculty member from the history department, starts talking about the lack of a humanities course in all STEM curricula. Well, the subject is important. It is not on the agenda for the meeting, which is focused solely on the computer science program. Jay, a faculty member from the computer science department, raises a point of order. She respectfully interrupts and states, point of order, the discussion of humanities in all STEM curricula, although significant, is not on today's agenda. I believe we should stick to the topic at hand, which is the proposed changes to the computer science curriculum. The chair, recognizing the deviation from the agenda, can respond, the point of order is well taken. Let's remain focused on the computer science curriculum as a plan. We can schedule another meeting to discuss the broader inclusion of humanities in STEM. Point of order and appeals are tools that keep the assembly on track, ensuring that the meeting is both efficient and effective. They offer a means to address grievances and correct a course upholding the democratic principle of the assembly. Understanding the rules that govern deliberative assemblies is important for effective governance and decision-making. For educational leaders, this knowledge equips you to lead more effective, fair, and transparent decision-making processes.